Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm here to introduce our uh, moderator for our second panel. And our second panel today is on measuring arts education access and engagement in the US results from a national pilot. So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, one of the panelists, the moderator for the panel, Sunil Iyengar. So if you don't know Sunil, um, it's very difficult not to know him if you do work in this area, especially in the United States. Sunil is the director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, he has been at the National Endowment uh, for several years. I actually don't know how long, Sunil, but I know that you've been, oh, uh, let's see, eight, be, seven. That could be taken as six or 15. It's 15. <laughs> <laughs> so Sunil has really expanded the research capacities of the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, I mean, to such, in, in such a way that in, in such a, in such a way that it, it's remarkable to think about how short of a time you've been there and what the endowment now does in the area of research. So um, I could go on and on with all of the different programs that you've started, but I think that we'll, you can get a, a good glimpse of that just taking a look at Sunil's bio in the program. So I just wanna say, so happy to have all of our panelists today and Sunil for um, helping putting this panel together and I will just leave it to you. Thank you so much, Joanna. That's so great to hear from you. And, and uh, it's so good to see so many uh, friends and, and new acquaintances here. I thank Indiana University for giving us this international platform for these very important topics. Um, I, this, this session is called Measuring Arts Education Access and Engagement in the US. And we're gonna describe how this is a, a, a very durable and important thread of uh, cultural heritage as we consider it, particularly around intangible assets. Um, I'm really pleased and privileged to have with me um, Sam Morso, who is the president of the Tribal Education Directors National Assembly, and Klaus von Zastro, who is the uh, principal, a principal at the Education Commission of the States. Uh, Klaus will be talking a about a project that the NEA and Education of the State, Commission of the States worked on over the last few years, and most recently, uh, the year right before COVID, I believe, uh, hit us. And, um, and then Sam will be offering his observations from his unique vantage. And we truly hope this will engage discussion. We'll definitely leave some time for Q&A and discussion. Um, I promised uh, Sam and uh, Klaus I'd give them fulsome introductions, but then I realized that their bios are in the pack. So I'm gonna go that way instead. Um, so um, just sticking with the slide for a moment, I just wanted to, um, you know, Michael Rushton, for those of you who were able to join this morning, gave a magnificent intro to this whole um, you know, conference. And, um, you know, actually it was his call for proposals that came out a long time ago, I think on the Cultural Research Network listserv uh, that hit a nerve with me because he was talking about intangible cultural heritage. And um, I wanted to, and I hope this doesn't seem too eccentric, I want to bring together three disparate strands of research at the NEA, all of which to me resonate with the dual themes of intangible that is, from our point of view, difficult to measure and cultural heritage, um, but applying the broadest possible frame to that term. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. And Klaus is my uh, pilot, uh, wing person here. I don't know what I would say. Uh, thanks, thanks, Klaus. Um, so these three items here, um, I'm gonna be talking about three types of cultural preservation, or perhaps I should have said heritage. Um, and I don't mean to sound reductive. Believe me, I know the matter is set with subtleties, um, but I would invite you to think of three distinct cultural resources that we can point to if we want to know how the NEA, for example, safeguards and promotes intangible cultural assets. Um, so uh, if you go to the next, well, I'll just say, if you stay with that, sorry, just for a moment. Um, historically, we've had a strong portfolio of what we might call folk and traditional arts, consisting largely of grants, you know, of projects in this area, as well as our national uh, heritage fellowships, spanning many different art forms and cultural traditions over decades. Uh, this is the NEA grant making I'm talking about. But especially for a crowd of researchers um, and policymakers, I invite you to look, think of the medium you swim in, uh, data and research tools as themselves a kind of cultural resource, uh, the historical record of arts and culture in everyday life. Um, this record also needs to be safeguarded, so I'll talk briefly about that. And third, uh, where these two bullets converge nicely for today's session, um, the system of arts education in this country, and how do we transmit learning about arts and culture over generations? So we go to the next slide. Um, we'll start with um, 
Uh, Klaus, if you can move the next slide, thank you. Uh, we'll start with um, the NEA's folk and traditional arts portfolio. Our research team did a portfolio analysis of these grants not long ago. And one thing worth reflecting on is that project activities of this type, whether exhibits, performances, apprenticeships, workshops, classes, or what have you, tended to occur in rural and poverty bound areas at much higher rates than other types of NEA grant projects. Nearly half of these projects served historically underserved communities, according to our data. Um, I think Klaus is having a problem getting in. I'm going to quickly share my screen so you can see it. And uh, Klaus will be back shortly, I'm sure. Um, I'll just pull this up. Hopefully you can all see it here. Yeah, so I'll go to the big page here. Um, sorry, slideshow. Okay, get us through this real quick. All right, so then, um, so th that's kind of what we, you know, we learned about this exercise, this portfolio review we did. Um, oh, here we go. And, um, and so uh, in that process, uh, as I said, we saw a lot of uh, projects serving, uh, quote, historically underserved communities, according to our data. So that was very interesting to know that our folk and traditional grants uh, reach those neighborhoods and those communities. Um, these findings and others are in the report shown on the next uh, slide. Um, if you can move it, Klaus. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, the first report, uh, these are the results, the first uh, report on the left-hand side are the results of our portfolio review, which itself triggered a brand new funding initiative at the Arts Endowment. And it's great when that happens, right? When research actually catalyzes new funding opportunities. Um, so that was called the National Folk Life Network that was, has resulted from uh, this portfolio analysis of folk and traditional arts at the NEA. Um, and so we're expecting to make awards for these uh, grants this summer. It turns out that for all the reach our folk arts grants demonstrated, we still had un, un, uncovered gaps, uh, primarily in seven U.S. regions, from rural, four rural and three urban. So the new initiative, the Folk Life National Folk Life, Life Network, um, will uh, include anchor organizations and participants to serve these areas. You can move to the next slide, please. Oh, actually, keep it there. Sorry. Uh, the other two reports you see here resulted from renewed engagement with tribal communities on behalf of the NEA. Um, it's, it's the next slide, Klaus, sorry. It's hard to do this dually, this is great, but I'm just grateful for your help here. Um, so uh, just, so these two reports on the right-hand side, um, uh, back in um, 20, February, 2020, just before the shutdowns from COVID, we gathered members from 40 tribal nations for an event called Native Arts and Culture, Resilience, reclamation and relevance. The proceedings from that event are in the second report shown here by the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. The third report is an up-to-date guide to federal opportunities for organizations looking for funding and other resources to support Native arts and cultural activities. I might add that our work here has been reinforced by presidential memoranda about tribal consultation and federal policies and programs and in building nation to nation relationships. On the next slide, please. Now I wanna to pivot to a different kind of uh, preservation, the legacy of data we at the NEA are responsible for harvesting and storing. Many of you already know about our long-term relationships with federal statistical agencies. Klaus, are you able to make this full, full screen? Having difficulty there? Oh, sorry. Um, federal uh, relationships with Sorry, Sunil, my, my controls just don't seem to be working. So I'm gonna give it a little more tries, but please proceed, my apologies. Okay, no problem, not at all. Thank you for helping. Uh, many of you know about our long-term uh, relationships with federal statistical agencies like the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, and the U.S. Census Bureau, both for administering surveys about arts and culture, but also for data extraction and analysis. Um, so the slide that comes right after this, thank you, Klaus, is just an unabashed plug for the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, elegantly termed NADAC, uh, which we've been running for a few years now out of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, um, it consists of uh, a growing batch of arts and cultural data sets, plus analytical tools, and a growing database of literature featuring these studies. Any uh, researcher out there, any researchers out there, I urge you to consider this as a place to park some of your own data sets. Um, when opportunity permits, I'll drop a web link into the chat. So just a couple more, um, you know what, I'll just quickly pull up mine, Klaus, don't worry about it. Um, okay. So just a couple more kind of PSAs before we get to the main event. Um, so this is the NADAC that I was telling you all about. Um, we do, of course, have a research grant opportunity, which we invite people to submit to. And you know, all this information is on our website. We also have a multi-year 
uh, Research Awards Program. Very proud to have IUPUI as part of this uh, with Joanna and Doug. Um, and we can you know, talk about that if people have questions later. Um, but I did want to kind of move to this. And so I've talked a little bit about our folk and traditional arts investment, how that's ramping up. Talked a little bit about our work with Native American traditions and also um, our work with data sets in general and cultural data sets sort of as a living record. Um, I now wanted to kind of get to the, to, the, to, the, to the entree, which is really about data sets in arts education and that as a, as a, as a variant of uh, cultural heritage. Um, so we, one of our grantees, I told you about our grants program, uh, his name is Ken Elpis at um, University of Maryland, has been a multiple recipient of NEA grants, research grants, um, and he has looked at um, secondary data analyses around the provision of arts education in this country and some benefits that have been associated with arts education. Um, there's a slim tradition of this research into arts education data sets, and we're now expanding it with a study of our own. So we're gonna be doing a, a scoping review. Actually, we've done completed a scoping review of several longitudinal data sets, the National Center of Education Statistics. Um, and we're now going to be um, taking these longitudinal data sets and uh, further analyzing relationships between arts engagement outcomes, as well as academic, uh, social and civic outcomes. So this will be interesting to uh, observe and we'll, I'll looking forward to sharing that in another forum. Um, if you could, actually it's me, be myself to the next slide. So this is really where we end. Uh, I just wanna tell you, um, kind of give you this waterfront, but, I, but kind of getting it back to um, grant making and policy, um, you know, it's not enough obviously to do these kinds of analyses. Um, we're really proud to have as a, as a sort of arts education director for the NEA at this point in time, Ayana Hudson, um, who's really been a visionary in this concept of collective impact uh, for grant making. So she or, she's launched this program, which is now going strong, uh, collective impact grant making, where the idea is to seed longer term, large scale projects in arts education. They're really community based or place based. And they center on data, partnerships, planning, uh, shared measurement strategies and programming. So, um, and, and what's great about this is if you've ever been a recipient of any grants, you may know that most of our grants, you know, it's kind of a one-off affair. We give a grant, that's it. And, you know, you may come back for more grants uh, if you apply, but, but this is a multi-year kind of project. And what's great about it is, um, you know, it, we do provide technical assistance and that's also somewhat rare for our agency to be able to provide extensively for our, our to run alongside our grants program. So we even have a nifty uh, logic model, which we won't go into, it was developed for all this. So all this stuff is on our website. I'll get off the floor, which I should have probably done a couple of minutes ago and seed it to, uh, to Klaus to talk, walk us through this project that I'm going to be talking, that, she's, that, that has to do with uh, the, the, really the title of the presentation, which is a pilot program we did here. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Sunil. And uh, first of all, let me apologize to everyone for the um, challenges that we faced with the, the, the PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna to try to start sharing again um, uh, to see, I, I don't know, can you all see screens flashing by you? All right, well, apparently when I got knocked out of the meeting, all of my controls stopped working and I had to shut down uh, PowerPoint and restart it. So here we are. And so, you know, in a wing and a prayer, we'll hope this will work. But I really, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, uh, thank, of course, uh, the institution for having us here. Thanks to Neil for, for his um, wonderful introduction about what the National Endowment for the Arts is doing. Thanks, Sam, of course, for joining us in this important conversation. So I would just very briefly say that you know, as Sunil mentioned, one of the things that we're really interested in here is talking about um, the way in which you actually measure arts education, you know, in, in a sense, it's like measuring something intangible, an intangible cultural resource. And uh, I wanted to address that a bit now through a specific lens or what you could call a use case. And that is, is it possible to measure cultural resources and how well they're being transmitted through arts education, particularly for specific groups of students. And one group of students that has been woefully neglected in this area is American Indian Alaska Native students. So what we did at the Education Commission of the States, which essentially helps education leaders in states with state policy questions, is we worked together with the National Endowment of the Arts, which sort of launched all this effort uh, to create tools and resources and knowledge for state leaders and others in states to be able to use to take advantage of data systems that already exist to begin to report on 
arts education. Um, so we did that. And while we were doing that, I came again and again across the challenge of reporting on important data for American Indian and Alaska Native students. And so, as I said, that's really going to be the focus of this particular um, particular presentation right now. But let me just start by saying that, you know, of course, it's important to measure cultural heritage. You know, it's, it's something it is seemingly intangible, but without measuring all these seemingly intangible things, they can disappear in reality and particularly for certain groups of students. And that's one reason why measurement was so important for us. Um, and arts education in particular was important uh, as, as Sunil has often mentioned because this is one of the most important conduits of cultural heritage. It's one mechanism for passing the heritage from one uh, generation to the next. Certainly not the only one, but for us at Education Commission of the States, certainly very important because it's one that can be influenced by state policy in some way. And so the question is, how much do we really know about young people's exposure to cultural resources, at least in schools? And I would have sort of a bipartite answer for that, or maybe a somewhat contradictory answer. And so on the one hand, it would be, we know actually more than many people would guess, but we know much less than people need to know. Uh, and so I will explain that a bit more as we continue. But the, that, that first half is actually really important for many people who sort of throw up their hands and say, it's very hard to measure such things, or at least understand what kinds of access students have to cultural resources. In fact, there are many states that collect many of these kinds of data already. And that's an important thing to realize. And so what little we do know is actually somewhat worrisome. So I'm just gonna go through a few indicators just as examples of the kinds of things we do know, which I think can tell us on the one hand that there is actually knowledge out there. And on the other hand, that some of this knowledge is, is certainly incomplete. So I'm gonna start with something that comes from the National Assessment of Educational Progress in Mathematics of all places. And it is there that you can sometimes when you dig around in what they call their contextual questions, find rather surprising things. And one of those surprising things is they ask the question to children. I mean, this is to students in eighth grade. Do you play an instrument and read music outside of school? And here's what we see for those who said they did so at least once or twice a week. Um, I'm going to now sort of reveal what happened with American Native students. They were significantly behind uh, students of every other race and ethnicity. Um, and uh, in this case, by significant, I mean statistically significant. So again, this is one of those questions which hides as much as it reveals, because on the one hand, it's useful to know, or do students have this kind of exposure? But on the other hand, what does that really mean? play an instrument and read music for many students, particularly American Indian, Alaska Native students that might not really tell us what's going on in their own exposure to cultural resources in their community because reading music and things like these are very Eurocentric kinds of ideas. So sometimes these questions themselves don't capture everything that they could. Um, there's another question buried in that same assessment, you know, lurking back there where almost no one had seen it until you do some, some finer analysis. And that was, um, are you taking a visual art course this year? And we see here that there is a statistically significant difference separating white students from students of every other race and ethnicity. So there is evidence already in some of these national data sets but by the way, do produce state by state data, that there are excuse me, statistically significant differences among students of different races and ethnicities. Um, now, if we drill down a little bit further and we try to see what's happening uh, with American Indian or Alaska native eighth graders, um, we do actually have a resource and that was from the National Indian Education Study, which just had results released in 2019, excuse me, last two weeks ago for 2019. So in other words, this is fairly late breaking data of, of what happened at least before the pandemic. And one of the questions they asked, they asked at least a small handful of questions that had some rel relation to cultural resources and the arts, um, was how much do you know about your American Indian tribe or Alaska native group? And we found that Sorry, I think uh, Klaus is frozen. Um, we'll be back with us in a moment.
he knows he's frozen. Let me just, uh, I'm sure he does. Well, I do want him to show you that slide and what he's going to show you because he did some uh, extra work here uh, to pull out uh, the data that we do know about um, Native American arts and cultural engagement through uh, those data sets. So I, I'm hoping it will pull, pop up shortly. Um, there's such a paucity of that information, but um, Klaus and his team are barely enterprising. We're able to um, extract some of it to share with you today. Ah, there we are. Klaus, um, can you unmute? Yes, my apologies, everyone. And a year and a half into Zoom presenting, this is the first time any of this has ever happened to me. I thought I was such an old hand. Um, a likely just, story. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking. If I might ask, did did I cut out? Where did I cut out? Did I cut out when we were talking about this? Right here, right here, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. So basically, the idea being that uh, only just under half of American Indian Alaska Native students said that they uh, that they knew nothing or only a little about their American Indian tribe or Alaska Native group. And of all students uh, who responded to this question, um, uh, it was only fewer than one in four who said they knew a lot about their own tribe or Native American group. Very quickly, again, have they attended a, mu a traditional music or dance performances in school? Um, less than a third said yes. And uh, of course, uh, more than two thirds said no. And so in this case, we see again that at least schools aren't necessarily conveying um, the cultural heritage as we would define it to American Indian or Alaska Native um, groups uh, in, in a way that I think would give many people a very solid confidence in what's going on. Um, and uh, in many instances, it seems that many students aren't getting that cultural heritage anywhere else if we're to believe their own accounts of how much they believe they think they know about their, their uh, uh, tribes or heritage. So um, really, I think a bigger question that we're going to be addressing here too is, you know, we've, we've seen those samples of data, but frankly, broadly, um, often American Indian Alaska Native students simply disappear from the data. Right? They're often there in such small samples that uh, when it's a sample-based question that's being asked, we get asterisks instead of information. And that happens again and again and again, or in other instances, it will look like there's an enormous gap separating American Indian Alaska Native students from others, but the gap is not statistically significant. And again, that's probably because the sample is thin. So that is a, a strong challenge that, that many researchers will face. But when you get to state data systems, that is administrative data systems, they really should have the universe of data. And so there might be privacy laws that get in the way of actually revealing some of those data. But in fact, um, there the sampling issue should not be quite as strong, though some data quality issues could be. So um, the, the challenge we have as well is that the pandemic has probably reduced access to arts education and cultural heritage even further at least through schools. And um, that's because people can't sing in, in indoor spaces. They haven't had access to facilities, all sorts of reasons. And so we see that the data we just looked at from 2019 are probably not representing the reality we face now. And with the widening gaps among different households in terms of income and the struggles they've had with the pandemic, very it's very likely many of those gaps will persist, particularly in areas with lower income households. So without real data on this though, uh, the condition of arts education will stay in the shadows as will our ability to be transmitting uh, this kind of uh, intangible cultural heritage. But the reality is states already have data, right? They do have data and they have mechanisms to, to, to get better data. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons that we wanted to convey with the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, so first of all, states are beginning to make data available and uh, we just, at the at Education Commission of the States, together with uh, the Arts Education Partnership, which is an initiative at, at the Education Commission of the States, released a dashboard on the blog that actually um, allows people to dig into those states that are actually publishing arts education data right now. 
So you, you can see that you can actually get down to the district and school level in many of these state databases. Um, and unfortunately, my I still have renegade controls and so on to chat, but I hope that if anyone's interested, you can contact me, I'd be happy to send you that link. Um, so there are more data than you'd think. And what we're trying to do and what the, the, the brainchild of the National Endowment of the Arts was here for the arts was that they would work with Education Commission in the States to help people do more of this, right? To help people actually create the mechanisms to get the data that exists in state data systems and make them public. So arts education can really benefit from what's been a revolution in data over the past 20 years or so. State data systems have become much more sophisticated. They'd be mostly because of mandates, often federal mandates, but it means that states are actually collecting a lot of information that they do not publish, uh, but those data exist. And so um, what we tried to do is we tried to create a set of tools and resources and technical assistance that really could support all 50 states while respecting every state's individual context since states have different systems that work in different ways. And so as I mentioned, the, the initiative really focused on tools and technical assistance. And I'll give you just a really quick, quick overview of the tools. Um, so first we described the current landscape. What, what do state's data systems look like now? We created tools for actually extracting those data and communicating about them in more efficient ways. We actually helped some states and state leaders in states begin to do more with the data that they have. And in the end, we reported on the lessons we learned through this. So very quickly describing the current landscape, um, where can stakeholders best engage? Uh, we reported on the kinds of metrics that you can typically report from states. And that generally means things like access to arts education. So students even have courses they can take. Access to teachers, are those teachers certified? And participation, are they actually taking those courses? And who, right? You can break these things down by student subgroups and by income levels and things like that, which are quite important. We also did a 50 state comparison to have kind of a summary of what each state's data system already had in terms of arts education so that people could see if their states collected these data, even if they don't report on them. And then we created a toolkit and that was to help non-experts in data make progress. And it had a generally four parts. One was, you know, what do you need to know even to get started in this kind of thing? The second piece is how do you request data from a state? You have to make a data request. And if you don't know how to do it, you're likely to get something you didn't really want. Third of all, how do you process these data? I mean, how do you analyze them? And the reality is in some cases, the, the idea here is be careful what you wish for. You generally, if you don't have data expertise yourself, need to work with a university partner or someone else who can actually handle data sets and things like privacy law and all of that. Part four, how do you report on the data? The reality is nowadays with all of these sort of data visualization platforms that some of you may have encountered like Tableau and others, it's easier and cheaper than it ever, ever has been. And part five, how do you use those data? Analysis and reported data, how do you make sure that those data are actually useful to people who can make change? But the challenges remain, and here I wanted to get back to the question of American Indian and, and uh, Alaska Native students, and that is that um, with these challenges, there are things that communities and state leaders can do to improve the data that in the, are in their data systems without having to overhaul those systems. And I think that's the good news, even in the face of these challenges. So, I mean, the first challenge that I kind of alluded to earlier is that American Indians and Alaska Native students are typically undercounted. Uh, if they're counted at all. So here's an example from Oregon where the US, uh, or excuse me, where the state's um, education agency got together with different tribes in the state to do a better accounting of how many American Indian students were actually in the state of Oregon. And they found that of the students who identified themselves as American Indian, 68 were actually percent were actually reported as Hispanic or Latino in the terminology that they used. In other words, they said they were American Indian and they were Hispanic Latino. So what gets reported is Hispanic Latino. And so those, uh, that other identity all but disappears. And then another 19% uh, uh, reported that they were two or more races, right? So it could have been American Indian and some, another race. And then that gets reported simply as two or more races. And again, that identity disappears from the data. And so of all of the students, who were to identify themselves as American Indian or Alaska Native, um, my <laughs> things are going backwards here, only 13% actually were reported as American Indian. 
And I suspect this is reasonably typical of many other states. So you see there's massive underreporting going on. Um, and there's also a, a challenge of reporting tribal identities. In other words, to which tribes do students identify with? Do they belong? In most states, this is not possible. Some states, this is becoming possible. Here I'm giving an example from uh, Tulsa Public Schools, so a, a public school system right here, which actually can report on tribal identities. And they, this is a, an excerpt from one of their reports where they have actually broken it down. Um, so that is another thing that is lacking right now. But the reality is that it's not a data system question, it's a data collection question. It's you can use the systems you've got and work with your communities in states to say, well, let's, let's break these identifications down better. Let's make this data more accessible and available. And of course, some of it can, can you know, be, not be publicly uh, published because of privacy laws, but you can still use it internally to improve those students' access to arts education. Another challenge is states lack course codes associated with native arts, right? So you very often need to have course codes to be able to say how much access students have to different kinds of arts. So I went through a national course code database that many states use, and I wanted to see are there codes for native arts courses, and I came up empty. I did see that there is arts addressed in some courses that address American Indian language, for example, and here I give an example where I highlighted what has to do with the arts. But in the most cases, these course codes don't exist, even though they're likely being taught in places. So just something like deciding you're going to narrow in on course codes and define them, as soon as you do that and enter into the system of a data system, that kind of information becomes available. So again, that's something that communities can work with states to achieve, or even with their local data systems to achieve, to make this information then more accessible. Now, I wanted to give you an example of something related to this, and that is in Alaska, a state which by their its own admission does not have the most sophisticated data system of, of states in this country. Um, they do actually have a teaching code, a teacher assignment code for teachers who teach Alaska Native Arts. And as a result, last year, they were able to report on access to Alaska Native Arts in schools. And here, the example I give from their report, it's just a screenshot, um, shows it by location. And you see that 14% of students in rural hub or fringe areas, for example, had access to these teachers. So again, it's, it's not the system that's able to do this, it's working within the system to create the kinds of definitions you need to be able to get a, a, at these kinds of data. Now, of course, there is a big challenge that remains, and that is that there are no standard measures for the quality and content of arts courses. People will often ask, are they any good? And, and frankly, most state, state data systems cannot tell you that. Um, maybe someday uh, that will be much better. I think they're getting more sophisticated, but that's something to work towards. So the big bottom line for this is that data systems are better than ever, and communities can ensure that they measure things. Uh, and and if, if that message comes out, I think we'll be able to get a lot of much better data without enormous overhauls of systems or huge amounts of expenditure, which tend to stop these things in their tracks. So my apologies for my various glitches, but I wanted to hand things over to Sam, uh, including the screen, right? Sam, you wanted to, you, I think you can just go ahead and share to share your slide. All right, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, to listen in on the, the comments that have been made. Uh, really, it's important to think about where we are today in terms of historically, in terms of serving uh, tribal communities. Um, and there's been very few um, times where awareness to the public has come other than um, the atrocities that have happened in boarding schools and mission schools. Uh, just recently, 215 remains were found at a um, boarding school, and that really lends to um, the thought that research is ceremony. Uh, for so many times uh, through mission schools and boarding schools with Native American communities, uh, they weren't um, understanding of the culture, the language of Native American communities. Oftentimes, uh, they were put in, in a westernized educational setting um, to uh, assimilate them into a westernized society. So it's really important as we think about um, historically how the education system has treated Native Americans 
um, to really think about the ones that have been lost, the ones that have been tor torn from their homes, and the ones that have ultimately perished in an educational setting. Uh, my job as a uh, director of education and uh, the president of the Tribal Education Directors National Assembly is to start thinking about how we can engage in government to government relationships to start securing some of this data. Um, and it really comes down to understanding the historical value of indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous methodologies and how Native Americans are inherently tied to the land uh, through their culture, whether it be uh, basket making or weaving or um, wood carving or um, canoe journeys. And so when you think about there are 574 federally recognized tribes in, this, in, the, in the nation, um, 12 being in the state of Michigan, each with their own, um, their own unique language, culture, and history, how do we get that into a public school setting? Knowing that 92% of all Native Americans are in that public school setting. Uh, as Klaus mentioned, there is uh, problems with the data set in terms of identifying Native Americans, and it really comes down to, uh, I believe, uh, data sovereignty within tribal nations. Uh, who has the most important enrollment numbers for their Native American students? Uh, how do they um, provide sustainability to their tribal nation? And also, how do they bring awareness to others that we work with uh, into the future? So when you think about research a ceremony, um, a lot of times uh, when you come into these settings, the data doesn't look very um, sexy. It's not a very appealing thing. It can, can be kind of a snooze fest. But when you think about how it impacts uh, Native Americans and uh, minorities in general, uh, I think that there's a lot of data systems and data sets that can be in, infused through memorandums of agreement or memorandums of understanding. And how do we get those, those cultural pieces in there? A lot of times Native American students do practice their language. And I think this uh, over the pandemic, we've seen a rise in um, being able to um, showcase what Native American communities are doing in a virtual environment. Uh, you see digital story coming up, you see beating workshops, and it's our job as educators to see how we can integrate some of their cultural experiences into the public school setting. Uh, as Klaus mentioned in, in Alaska, they do a wonderful job because a lot of times the public schools cannot reach them in those rural settings and they're re relying on their traditional elders their traditional speakers to provide some of that cultural content and that is so important to the the identity of a student in, as they venture through their academic career to make sure that they have that connection to their homeland as they uh, gain some critical inf in, uh, academic knowledge and going into the future so what does that look like a lot of times tribal education departments do not have access to that data uh, simply because of the FERPA laws. Uh, so it protects the families, but in, in long term, when you think about student dashboards, you think about attendance at rates, or you think about uh, uh, disciplinary issues, and you start to understand why Native Americans are overly um, populated into special education is because there's not that cultural context and they're not looking at the cultural values of the Native American students. So it's much easier to classify them as slow or as not uh, being receptive. Uh, but in reality, it's those traditional cultural protocols that they're adhering to. Uh, and that in addition to uh, a lot of the languages, as, as Klaus said with the, um, how do we collect data? A lot of times the historical trauma of mission schools, boarding schools and public schools, uh, does not uh, allow a, a really convenient for Native American families to say that they're Native American for, for, for that fear of that historical trauma. So it's really important for uh, government agencies such as tribal education departments working with not only their uh, local education agency but state education agencies to ensure that those data is being properly reported. And how do we infuse some of those factors? Um, one of the things that we've done with the Pokagon Band is really start setting up these uh, MOUs, which will allow us to use our data sharing agreement to help the state uh, clear up some of the uh, enrollment issues that they have in terms of identifying Native American students. Uh, when we are able to do that, we are able to set up uh, dashboards and regional context in terms of how many Native American students are, we are serving, not only within our region, uh, with our own tribal citizens, but Native Americans across the board. Uh, because of the relocation efforts, uh, and displacement efforts of the United States government, a lot of times Native Americans are not in their traditional homelands or in traditional territories anymore. So it brings up a very interesting question is how do uh, tribal education departments serve students who are across the nation 
uh, with the various cultural resources and educational opportunities that they have. So when you think about um, reaching out or if you're an educator in a public school setting, um, sometimes it's, it's important to uh, it, it, uh, acknowledge um, the, the historical teachings. But a lot of times you get um, brushback of saying that, that can not be um, completed in those, those codes, but it's really about es establishing those relationships and, and breaking down some of those policies. Uh, a fantastic example is um, getting physical education credit uh, for going on a ca canoe journey out in Washington State. Um, but there's also a lot of um, beating contacts um, when you turn about uh, doing uh, uh, traditional formats with beads, you can break those downs into quadrants as far as a math requirement. So it's slowly looking at the policies uh, and procedures, uh, not only within the LEAs, but at the state level to see what kind of maneuverability that we have in terms of um, emphasizing the arts uh, and education. A lot of times awareness levels come out. Uh, so within the tribe, we have uh, public schools come out to the reservation homelands just to bring out um, that awareness of uh, there's another government uh, very closely related to your school and how do we um, you know bring and bridge that barrier I, i'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak a little bit on the the data sets uh, there is a lot of work to be done um, and i and i encourage everyone to think about research as ceremony because um, just like those 215 who were, who were never able to make it home it's important for us to think about um, protecting the culture, the welfare, and, and, and uh, identity of all of our students. Uh, miigwech uh, and Moena. Wow, thank you so much, Sam. And thank you, Klaus, a wonderful uh, lineup here. Um, and I love the idea of research as ceremony. Um, I, I see one, at least one question in the chat and I'd encourage others to chime in, please do. Um, one question is, how did the NEA and state organizations honor and involve Native American communities in determining values, indicators, and measurement? So I would just echo what Sam said toward the end. There's a long, long way to go in doing this work. And I certainly can't speak for the various state arts agencies and for that matter, local arts agencies who do some of this, um, but also have their own strategies. Um, but I can say that, um, at the National Down for the Arts. Fortunately, we are now aligned. Our agency, I think, has more incentive than ever, if I can put it that way, to, to, to fully incorporate uh, values from um, traditions and populations that have not been uh, central to uh, a lot of our grant making in the past. And so when I say incentive, I mean simply that the, the, this particular administration has put a big premium, as you know, on on um, on this factor, you know, through executive orders and um, you know, bringing back even executive orders from the past or executive policies from the past, and and making sure that federal agencies are attuned to these considerations. So I know that's kind of a soft answer, but we are in fact working closely, particularly through Cliff Murphy, who is our head of uh, folk and traditional arts, to do more tribal consultation, nation to nation consultations in the general scheme of things. We just put out a call for comments not long ago on a draft on our efforts to draft a new strategic plan. And I understand that was discussed as well uh, with tribal communities. Um, I will say before leading that question though, um, some of you may be interested to know, if you don't know, uh, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation is supporting some work around performing artists. Uh, they're doing a scan around performing arts, uh, people, Native Americans who work in performing arts uh, uh, the field, let's say, fields. Um, and it is, it is sort of a, a first kind of an environmental scan to understand what's going on. And I think there may be an original data collection there too that will result, but we're proud that, happy that Doris Duke is supporting that. Um, any questions for all of us? And, oh, Sam, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I could just add a little bit to that. Um, in 2016, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act has a mandate that you must consult with the local tribes. Now, putting that a policy into practice, I think, is, is still on a, a roadblock, uh, but we are slowly getting there. I know that the state of Michigan has done wonderful things in terms of revising their social study standards to make sure that they are more reflective of indigenous communities. Um, but I think that every state plan that they had to turn into the feds, there had to be a, consul a tribal consultation requirement in there. Um, and yeah. uh, also it's required for the local education agencies when they're dealing with specific grants. 
So it's really, I think that our voice is being uh, uh, heard by being by being at the table, and I can only expect that it will slowly improve as time goes on. Yeah, and I'd seen actually, that's a good point. I'd seen a uh, presidential memo, I think, um, from this administration about that that very uh, 2016 uh, executive order, kind of re reinvigorating it. Um, Michael. Yeah, you know, I'm going to ask a Canadian question, but in the uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in the Canada Council for the Arts uh, strategic plan, uh, their most recent ones have given real uh, priority strategy uh, to the development and encouragement of Indigenous arts, uh, in, in part because of the long decades of neglect, essentially, in making up lost ground. Is there much um, interagency cross-border uh, consultation on, on what's happening up there uh, with regards to what's happening at the NEA? Uh, since it's about the NEA, I have to say not at this time in a very robust way, although I will, I will add that, and you may be aware of this, Michael, and some of you, uh, we have very uh, regular consultations, or you can call it that, or um, emails, but exchanges, but actually virtual meetings every quarter now with our, with our Canadian counterparts from the research office there, and they, they have alerted us, and we, are very, we kind of eat it up whenever they have a new report, particularly about these issues of tribal consultation and and have really you know done a lot more with indigenous populations in terms of research with them you know not on them but with them you know I think that's kind of uh, been something we'd like to emulate certainly in the research capacity at the NEA I think there's also through Mike mm -hmm. Lorlove who heads our international um, activities at the NEA he's also been tracking a lot of what's been going on in Canada in particular but I think they have a really exemplary example exemplary um, process for that, for integrating those, as you say, through their strategic planning. I also think uh, Australia has done a terrific job with our Aborigine communities. And I think those are two places we can think of where there's documentation, there's been uh, you know, case studies and actual data analyses to understand how um, to treat, how to provide equity. Uh, and, 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 and I love what you said, Sam, about uh, resilient pot, you know, instead of historically underserved, maybe thinking about this as historically resilient communities. Um, and that's something we'll you have to all kind of learn about here in the US, but certainly at the National Endowment for the Arts. Any comments on that question, uh, Sam, or any thoughts about what's been going on to our, with our neighbors to the north? Have you been following any of this? I mean, apart uh, from sadly what you just shared, yeah. Yep, um, I'm part of the the Potawatomi Nation, um, which is consists of uh, tribes not only in Michigan but also in in Canada, and in the larger Three Fires Anishinaabe network. So there's been a lot of uh, collaboration amongst the Three Fires Confederacy to bring uh, different awareness of arts, whether it be storytelling or beading or uh, wood carving, uh, really to start building those foundations of education. And it's it's I think it's in preparation for the consultation with uh, other governments, other local education agencies in terms of the advancement of our cultural arts. Great. Neil, um, th thanks for the, uh, the very interesting uh, presentation. And Sam, you know, I, I wonder, I'll, I'll try to, I think, weave a couple of questions together and, and see, if, see if it makes sense. When, when I first started, working with the Arts Endowment back in the 70s as a panelist, when folk arts were just coming online, and you kind of had two things going on. It, as, as folk arts started to grow and work with the Native American uh, population, we concentrated on going to tribes. Tribes qualified as destinations for direct NEA grant making. And so that was sort of the thinking. We're going to, if we're going to preserve heritage, if we're going to advance, you know, understanding within tribes, we're going to support the tribes because they're going to do that themselves through festivals and gathering and traditional practices and crafts and so on. They're going to take care of it. At the same time, if you moved over to, say, the music program, their education and continuity was really all about going to the public schools and convincing them. That they needed to do more, and uh, and 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 so, I wonder if one, as as we advance investment in and in, in interest in Native American and uh, and Alaskan tribal uh, culture preservation and and, and and 
preservation for the future, are the schools the places to figure this out? Or is it really just to should we just expand our work with tribes? And to shift over to the other half of my question, you know, right now, if you're a, like an amateur guitar player like me, you can go online and you can learn about Django Reinhardt and you can get, you know, look at the few images of him performing and you can get modern teachers showing you how to play his style. In other words, you have an extremely elaborate, vigorous arts education system that is completely away from what the schools are doing. And, and so both in terms of measurement, what, what do we look at in terms of figuring out what's going on? And then in terms of uh, you know, engagement to try to make things better, is, is this continual look, looking at schools, particularly the public schools, is that, is that where we should be, given how much the total yeah. context has changed from when I got involved in the 70s? So I'm kind of, I'm the, I'm the kind of have your cake and eat it too kind of person. Like I feel there's, it's really, and I want to turn this over if you don't mind to Klaus first, because uh, he hasn't had as much uh, time in the Q&A and then Sam as well. Um, but, and I know I've had a lot of time, but let me just indulge me for a moment. Um, I, I like what you're saying. And I think we have to find means to track, and I say track in a very loose way, but to, you know, to understand comprehensively those various forms of engagement uh, with arts and culture. And so, of course, as you know, Bill, um, you know, you were, you've led a lot of this, but, you know, in the past, we, through our survey of public participation in the arts, we, we continue to track some more, let's say, traditional, and, and traditional is, is a difficult word here, let's say, conventional yeah. ways that people talk about arts participation in this country. Uh, and, and we do have questions about out of school learning and that kind of thing, for example. Um, but that's not going to get us full, it's not going to be a, in itself, it's not going to provide a comprehensive indicator of what we're talking about. So we definitely need to go to these other means. And so schools, we do want, we do feel, and so when I said the have your cake and eat it too comment, it's, you know, we do need to know what we can get, what we can pull out of the data that's in schools and how can we elevate it. But always be mindful, that's one vantage point and be very clear about what the sourcing of that information was, what the orientation of the research question is. And then separately, alongside with that, be very vigorous in our involvement engagement, say with um, Native American, groups and understand from their perspective or more organically, what is their, um, uh, what, are, what are the cultural traditions we should be continuing to uh, trace and how, and how do we preserve and amplify that? So it's, it's kind of, we can't be everywhere at once, but I think we have to invest uh, in a way, in an equitable way so that those data systems that are based in schools, we were able to lift up even alongside what we're learning through online learning and digital learning, and as well as in tribal areas. Um, that's a very probably unsatisfactory answer. And it's, it just suggests that our resources are strapped and we have to make choices occasionally about where to put which of those buckets to kind of do a new initiative or project. I just have to say, since Bill's on the call, I've always, and I think a lot of us admire and have always admired how he has been very much a listener and, and learning from the practitioners and the traditions themselves, rather than uh, seeking to impose a particular uh, perspective on those traditions, and that's something we hope to emulate. Uh, Klaus, can I turn to you in case you have anything to say? Sure, I would only have a little to add, and that would be um, that I would agree with your sort of both and <laughs> comments um, here. Um, now, one thing that I've noticed, and, and unfortunately outside of the arts, so this might be not be entirely uh, you know applicable, but that is that very often things that we would hope would be happening outside of schools seem not to be happening outside of schools. That is to say that, you know, when we think that communities can sometimes do these things, maybe they can, but sometimes it just doesn't seem to be happening in areas outside of the arts where we look at, out, you know, extracurricular community out of school kinds of um, behaviors, or that they're happening with a huge amount of, um, Right, that some communities are getting it, some aren't, some students are getting it and some aren't. And so one of the reasons why having data systems about what happens to schools, the schools to some degree can be um, equalizers. Um, they can try to make up for, they often, unfortunately often exacerbate, but in theory they can um, counteract some of these inequities. And the second piece I would say is that um, it also differs from community to community. 
Uh, and one community may very well see a partnership between schools and out of school um, agents of some sort uh, as a means of conveying cultural heritage. And I've seen that in places like Chicago, for example. I mean, it's not very applicable to this specific instance, but I think that can happen. And so having data systems that go down to the community level as they all do, can give you that amount of flexibility to understand what's happening in your community and what might be best for your community in terms of that mix of in and out of school. Sam, no, like, Sam. thank you very much. Yeah, I would just say, Ed, that the, we're just touching the, the surface of it. I think tribes have a, a tremendous amount of resources in terms of um, drum groups, uh, drum making, rattle making, um, but those opportunities haven't been afforded to a whole bunch of uh, public school students outside of the tribe. Uh, one of the things that we've done with Pokagon Band has brought thousands of public school students to our traditional homelands to learn about oral storytelling. And then you think about um, the spoken word and how what the, how that teaches it and how people are engaged in that that experience. It's really about how do we collect that. So instead of just field trips uh, to uh, a traditional homeland or a tribal homeland, I think it's also important to set up secondary things where you can have subject matter experts come in and show them how to make a rattle or how to make the drum. And then you can do hand drum songs along with that. So there's a tremendous opportunity because tribes across the nation also want to bring awareness of their culture and their rich culture and the rich history um, and create those uh, relationships. And I think that we are just scratching the surface of, of how do we implement some of those things. Um, a lot of times it's just a field trip to a traditional homeland or just to go see a powwow but having them make their own regalia, having them look at and making their own drums and practicing those things are, are some of the opportunities that, that could be explored. Thank you, Sam. I see we're almost at time. Is there one more question or comment anyone would like to make either on this panel or on the uh, watching us? Don't see any hands, just checking. I think we may be good. Um, no, I think, I think it's really, uh, both the comment about scratching the surface and what you said, Klaus, about, um, you know, kind of that, you know, that the data are malleable, that we, we do have ways to, without doing a fundamental systems change with data to extract information. Those, those are two things to kind of remember. Uh, sorry, I see somebody, was it from Art City? I couldn't get your name. Maybe this could be our last question. I think we have to wrap up. Sure, it's Eddie Ayub here uh, from uh, Art City. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes, in Winnipeg, you, yeah, Winnipeg, Canada, which is just north of your, um, um, I guess, Grand Forks, North Dakota. So I guess uh, I just want to like describe sort of what I mean, I, you're describing the need for like uh, arts programming, perhaps outside of the school system. Uh, the organization that I work for, I'm our artistic director of Art City. And uh, it's like right after school at 3.30 all the way into the evening and there's a big dinner uh, served and it's just visual arts based programs free. And it was uh, it was um, founded in this inner city neighborhood, West Broadway in, in Winnipeg uh, that, you know, at the time uh, was like, you know, almost entirely like, you know, indigenous children uh, attending the program. Now it's a much more mixed group uh, because a lot of newcomers uh, live in the, in the neighborhood, too. But um, I think that, like, you know, traditionally, there's a lot of fear from like the arts, like about getting involved in what would maybe be like looked at as social work. Uh, but there's a lot of intersection between like, I mean, you can't separate art from culture. And so I don't have, have so much of a question. I guess I'm just trying to like, just sort of describe that like, you can't be hesitant. I think I think the, the best thing to do is just like create a space, um, the create, create the space that you want, that you you know needs to exist. And don't be afraid of, of putting yourself out there and just, you know, obviously like, do your due diligence and, and do it right. So if we're talking about like get you know access to like culture, if, if you don't have that, bring in guests. Like the, you know don't don't engage in cultural appropriation. So we we bring in artists like all the time to share their practice through the program. We're not copying them or finding them on the internet and copying their ideas or cultures. Uh, and also it, it allows us to like be more like um, you know in school there there you know art education might. Uh, focus more on uh, traditionally on, on European artists from like hundreds of years ago. I'm not going to go on and on. I, 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 it's, I've got lots to say here. I'm really thankful to, to be 
you know, to be in this, but. Uh, oh, thank you for the comment. I think we'll let it stand as a comment. That's great. Um, and I want to thank my pa fellow panelists, uh, Klaus and Sam, really, really great job. There was a lot of, we had a lot of great conversations leading up to this. And I thank you for that education as part of this process. And uh, we do hope to do, do right and do better uh, in this capacity. So thanks everyone who participated and love the panels, by the way, that have been going on so far. Uh, if I can turn it over to you, Joanne, I think, is that yeah. correct? Yes, thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Klaus. And thank you for all of those wonderful questions and discussion. So we are at a break now. We're going to take about an hour, an hour, five minutes. And um, please do join us for our next panel, which will be at 1.30. And uh, this is panel C and um, is has a variety of papers um, and I think will just be great. And then our last official, I think panel is going to be our keynote right after that. So I really do hope that everybody joins us for the afternoon. We've had such a great morning. I'm so thankful to everybody. So with that, um, go and eat some hummus. Okay.